Hello and welcome to As I See It, A Blind Woman's View. My name is Andrea Giudice and I am the host and I think I get to be called a producer, which is very exciting. And I am here with my guide, Doug, who as always, I'm not introducing because um, people not using his name keeps him focused on his work and us safe as a team. As I mentioned last month, we are in the um, starting phases of a series that I've been working on for about a year. and I'm so excited that we're doing it. It's called Pup and Person to Partners. And I'm following the path of how a person would prepare to go and become a, the human partner in a guide dog team and how a puppy goes from its adorable eight-week-old self to a fully grown, trained guide dog such as the one here on the floor. Last month, we talked about what the puppy does to get ready to go to learn to be a guide dog. This month, we're focusing on the, what the, mobility, the orientation and mobility training that a blind person needs to receive and master before becoming eligible to work with a guide dog. And I have a fabulous guest with me who's been here before, John Wykelonis, who's an orientation and mobility specialist. But I want to just give you a, a little personal piece of my history, which was that when I wanted to get my first guide dog, I was very excited because I was under the impression that I would no longer have to think or know where I was going. That I would simply say to my dog, no matter where we were in the world, I want to go to Dunkin' Donuts. And the dog would just go. It would be fabulous. I wouldn't have to know where I was or remember any route. Uh, when I got my first guide dog or when I was getting prepared to go to get my first guide dog, I learned that in fact it's much different than that. That the skills that I had and have as a cane traveler are critical and, and absolutely essential to my success as a guide dog traveler because we work together as a, as a team, somewhat like a pilot and a navigator. My guide dog's job is to get me from point A to point B, navigating safely through the world that I'm walking through, keeping me safe from obstacles and changes in, in elevation, things like that. My job is to know how to get there and to issue the commands whether it's right or left, to know how many blocks I need to walk before I turn left, to know how many streets to cross and how to cross them safely, that's my job. So it's not like the magic I was expecting. It's a very different and wonderful magic. To be able to have that kind of knowledge, it takes a lot of training and a lot of important learning. And that's what I have John here to talk about today, is what, what is he working on with a client when they are getting ready for going to class, going to school to be paired with a guide dog. So that's, that's what I'm looking for tonight, John, is that sort of very specific piece of the amazing work that you do. Yeah, and there are a, a number of reasons why people might contact an orientation mobility instructor to get ready for a guide dog, and certainly that's something that we in the state um, very often do get requests for. Um, for instance, somebody may be interested in a guide dog, but they've never really had any formal orientation and mobility training, and most of the guide dog schools like you to have had that now. Or the school may want some additional training. They may have done an evaluation on the client and said, you know, we want you to get Get a little bit more training before we think you'll be ready for a guide dog. So this is where we would come in and we would come in and we kind of, if you will, prep the person to go to the guide dog school and be a little bit more ready, a little bit more prepared for the training that they're, that they're going to offer there. Let me step back for a second. I'm throwing around, we are throwing around the term orientation and mobility mm -hmm. training. Just give a very brief overview of what that exactly means. Okay, orientation and mobility training essentially is training to give you skills to travel independently. Okay, and that would involve uh, usually use of a long cane or use of a guide dog. Um, certainly the, the schools kind of handle the, the, the dog guide per portion, whereas if it's a long cane, it would be someone such as myself that would do that portion of the training. Okay. And so what level are we look is a guide dog school essentially looking for when you're thinking about a client who says to you, oh, John, I really want a guide dog. I think it would be awesome. Well, there's a number of things they look for. Most people think, oh, gee, you know, I want to travel with a guide dog. Let me just call up the school and go get one. It's not quite that easy. And, and in fact, probably a fairly small percentage of people who are visually impaired really would qualify or be a good candidate for a guide dog. They're obviously looking for someone in, in reasonably good health because dogs are going to zip along at three 
three to four miles an hour. Um, they need somebody who has a, uh, a, a use for the guide dog because there is a, an expense involved with training. I've heard figures of forty to fifty thousand dollars involved to actually train a, a guide dog in, in, in the person. Um, so they obviously don't want a, a pet that, that goes home <laughs> for fifty thousand um, dollars. So they want somebody who's going to use the dog and also it's important that the dog is used so it doesn't lose its training because over time if the dog isn't used they can go oh, you know, they kind of forget things like us and so they need to be used on a regular basis so they tend to screen candidates fairly rigorously to make sure that they would be a good candidate they don't want to waste their time they don't want to waste the person's time as well as well as the money so there are a number of things you know I started thinking about you know jotting down some ideas that I wanted to get across tonight um, and there's a, a number of skills that the orientation and mobility instructor can offer a person uh, to help prepare them for a guide dog um, number one is we really teach as part of orientation and mobility training is awareness of the environment okay uh, you need to know what your surroundings are both to know where you're going and also obviously for safety I've had people that could travel well but they didn't have that sense of safety and I always worried that they would place themselves in danger inadvertently. For instance, we might teach them to pay attention to different sounds. Traffic sounds, obviously, um, and things you might find in the environment as you travel through and might use for orientation clues. Things like air conditioners, uh, exhaust fans, um, fountains, things like that that you might find in the environment. So we're really teaching them to start using their other senses as they travel. Uh, we might teach them how to use uh, certain smells. You know, that coffee shop sure smells yeah. good in the morning, you know. <laughs> uh, you might want to find a bakery, um, a deli, uh, things like that. Um, I've actually gone by leather shops or mm -hmm. shoe shops that had that nice smell of leather coming out. Yep. And they served as very good orientation clues. Uh, in a mall, Abercrombie and Fitch used to use um, uh, both a sound, <laughs> very loud, but also they used to make a scent come out yep. of the store as well, which is very interesting, and you could always know where you were by that. So there's a number of different things like that that you can use for orientation. Um, um, I want to say open spaces versus closed spaces. You know, um, I know it is facial vision where you kind of sense that a room is open or a room is closed. But you can also do that inside, outside. You know, is a building close to you? Is there an alleyway with a wind coming through it? Things like that. Your sense of just general sense of, of space. Um, also, just the different uh, environmental layouts people need to be familiar with. You know, uh, a rural residential area, a rural area, business area. They need to have had experience traveling in, them, in these because as part of their training, they obviously will be using a guide dog in those different types of environments. Orientation and mobility training introduces them to these environments and how to travel through them. Um, the second thing I have down is, uh, you know, time distance utilization. Um, one of the things that you need to learn how to to do as a traveler is estimate time and distance. You know, gee, I'm walking along, I'm just about ready at this destination, or I know this place that I want to get to is about halfway down the block. Well, what is halfway down the block? You've got to develop a sense of what that's like. Uh, that's something that we also develop in orientation and mobility. Um, safety and decision making at street crossings, particularly uh, at light controlled crossings, extremely important. You can't tell the dog, you know, take me across when you're ready. No, <laughs> it just doesn't work that way, you know, or just remind them, look both ways now and we're gonna go, you know. Um, it's the owner who's making that decision as to when to cross. And uh, there's a lot of considerations that, that come to the fore when you're thinking about stepping out into that traffic or, or stepping out across that street. Um, you need to learn about using the surge of traffic at a light control crossing okay um, what cars do I listen to what can they do what do I have to be aware of um, what are the different audible pedestrian uh, signals that are available now you know what are the different types where do I find them how do I find them how do they operate um, what can I depend on them for what can I not depend on them for that's very very important um, turning cars, traffic sounds. Okay, what does the car sound like when it's going straight as opposed to when it's slowing down and making a turn? Okay, very important sound to be able to differentiate. Um, the different types of vehicles, Mack truck versus sedan versus electric cars now, you know? A very big concern uh, for orientation and mobility because some cars, when they come to a stop, they shut down. You don't know that car is there 
when you go to cross the street until a person steps on the accelerator. That can be very startling to, to start uh -huh. cross and all of a sudden, boom, that, where'd that car come from two feet from me, you know? Um, something that it's good to get used to and develop strategies for coping with. Um, and certain things like sound masking, which is a, a feature where you can have one sound masking another. Well, what do you do? Do you wait for that sound to go away? Do you kind of go somewhere else? What are some decisions to make in situations like that? Um, another thing that we teach in orientation and mobility is route selection, okay? Sometimes um, shorter is not always better. Mm -hmm. You know, if there's a particularly unsafe crossing yep. uh, along a route, you might say, you know what? I'd rather go down one more block, cross where there's a nice APS, and get across there and then come back to where I want to go. In the neighborhood that I live in, there are two audible crossings that I feel safe and have been instructed, in fact, by you, that are safe to cross at. So if I'm going from one part of my neighborhood to the other, I will walk an entire, it's a short street, but an mm -hmm. entire street out of the way so that, I don't, so that all of the crossing that I make are at those two points, mm -hmm. no matter what, what area I'm headed to in my neighborhood, because I'm not going to get myself involved in some of those really unsafe, more involved, everyone has a turning lane kind of crossings. Yeah, exactly. Orientation and mobility and training and, and um, travel of any kind with a vision impairment. Um, I really don't really talk about safe and unsafe anymore because there's no such thing as being perfectly <laughs> That's safe. That's true. I really preach to my, my students the level of risk. What is the level of risk that you're taking here? Mm -hmm. And how can you lower that risk so that you stack the odds mostly in your favor when you go out traveling? And it's very, it's a, it's a cerebral exercise and people have to get used to thinking about that. You know, what is safe? What is not safe? What can I do? What I can't do? You know, I don't go, you know, rock climbing because I don't think it's very safe, but I will go on a hike, you know, on a level <laughs> surface. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's, it's what level of risk am I comfortable with? Right. Uh, it's that type of thing. Um, so that's about route selection. Um, um, finally, just the general travel experience that you get from orientation and mobility. You get, uh, you know, you, you, we teach people how to travel in residential areas. We teach people how to travel in business areas. We teach people bus travel. Um, we might teach people how to travel in a mall. Just exposure to a lot of different environments. So all of these things are applicable to traveling with a guide dog. Because if you don't have sight, there are certain things you got to keep in mind. And a good foundation uh, to get those with the guide dog is to get it from an orientation and mobility instructor and long cane training first. And even though right now in this particular series we're talking about the end goal of being partnered with a guide dog, the things you're describing, the, 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 the skills and methods that you're describing will enhance anyone's independence and freedom and courage so much even if they never want a guide dog, regardless of mm -hmm. the reason they don't want one. The skills you're talking about are fabulously important for anyone who's experiencing vision loss or is blind or visually impaired because being able to know, to have the tools to be able to go out of your own home and do what you want on your own time and in your own way and at your own pace or whatever is so critical to keeping feeling independent and feeling good about yourself and having freedom of choice. So regardless of whether someone's looking for a guide dog, these are imperative skills to learn. Yeah, and they're very good. And you know, and I've had people that have really have not done much traveling um, with a long cane, let's say, but they wanted a guide dog because they were in a situation where they could utilize it. And I've gotten the call and I had one particular gentleman and this gentleman was, you know, he was 80 years old, but he was an active 80 year old. And normally you'd say 80 years old, you know, he can't call off for a guide dog. But you know what? We said, okay, let's do some training. And I brought him and did some training, uh, much as I described here. And he went and uh, reapplied to the guide dog school, was accepted, and is now a happy guide dog user. And so there are situations like that where the, the preparation is everything. It really allows the person to get yep. what they want to um, and meet their objective. That's awesome. And the, and the reality is that as a guide dog user, while my dog is with me the vast majority of the time, there are moments situations, places that I go that while it may be legal to bring him there, it doesn't make sense. If I'm going, I went to a huge concert not so long ago, there was no way I was going to bring him to the, you know, the, the, the huge, very loud thousands of people at the concert. So if I'm not with him, if for, either he, I've chosen not to bring him or he's not able to come or whatever the reason mm -hmm. is, I need to have the, the skills to use my long cane so that I can if I get separated from the person I'm with, who I'm doing sighted guide with, if I happen to be with someone who's an opposite gender and I need to go to the ladies' room, um, whatever the, the situation is, those skills are critical. There mm -hmm. are times between dogs when you can't, 
when you're without a dog, I, that's happened to me, and you, you can't just become a shut-in. Mm -hmm. I want to. I know personally I want to. But I still have all those things I did when I had the guide dog still have to get done. Mm -hmm. And so I need to have the skills to do them safely for me and to get safely through the environment I live in. Yeah, exactly. Now, one of the things that you'd also mentioned to me that you were interested in covering um, was really how do you, what's the difference between traveling with a cane and traveling with a guide dog? And as you mentioned, there are times when even as a guide dog user, you may still have to resort to a cane where it's just more appropriate. Absolutely. Um, but again, there's some very interesting differences between traveling with the two different methods. Um, the first thing that came to mind was the speed of travel. Um, certainly with a guide dog, <laughs> you can travel much quicker. Yes. Um, you're zipping along, you're going through the environment uh, with a cane a little slower and uh, it's a different pacing. Interestingly, if you go from being a cane user to a guide dog user, your time distance is thrown That's off. what I was thinking and when you mentioned that. Yes. I'm like, yeah, it, 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 it's so much different because it takes so much longer, I notice mm -hmm. when I'm using my cane, to get to the same, I'm like, I don't, I, I, my, pl my planning is off mm -hmm. because I think, oh, I can get there in five minutes. Well. Not so much if I'm using the cane because yeah. I'm walking more a, slowly. A, Everything a takes a whole a different thing. Yeah, blocks feel totally different walking it fast with a guide dog as opposed to walking a little bit slower with a cane. Um, distance of travel is usually different. Usually guide dog travelers tend to travel longer routes and longer distances just because uh, they can because they're going to be traveling faster. Whereas cane users can travel longer routes, but it becomes very tedious and many of them don't choose to do that and, and do shorter routes. So that's another difference between the, the guide dog versus the, uh, the cane. Um, Obstacle detection is kind of interesting. Um, if you walk a route with a cane, you know, you're eventually going to find all the features along it. You're going to find that mailbox. You're going to find that planter. You're going to find those parking meters. Um, whereas with a guide dog, you just go through space. You go around them. You may feel a little jog to the left, a little jog to the right, but that's about it because the dog is meant to avoid those obstacles, whereas the cane actually just finds those obstacles. Very different way of traveling. It is. I, I, when I most recently between this dog and the, and his um, the dog that's that was that preceded him, I was without a dog for about four months, and I was travel. I was walking along a plaza that I go to almost every day, and all of a sudden I found a garbage can. And I'm like, oh my god! I've been walking mm -hmm. along here for years and had no right. idea would, that there was no a garbage can here. There. Exactly. But now right. I've tucked that knowledge away. So the other day I was there, I had him. I knew there was a garbage can unless someone had moved it. But like, so in a way, there's some. There's something to be said for learning about those things that, you know, sort of tuck them away in case you need a bench or a garbage can mm -hmm. or a mailbox. Yeah, exactly. And the only time you would know about a feature if somebody pointed it out to you and then you targeted the dog on right, it. So exactly. they knew it was there, you know. Um, so um, another thing that, that is really kind of interesting is the environmental information. The cane gathers a lot more tactical information, as we just mentioned, the mailboxes, the planters, the things like that. Whereas the guide dog is just going to kind of go through, and you may pick up some information underfoot or things like that, but that's about it, you know. The cane kind of you travel in the environment, the dog you travel through the environment. Kind of interesting. Um, now, let's talk about the skills that are utilized uh, as you travel with a guide dog as opposed to traveling with a cane. Um, I think the, the guide dog user kind of depends on the general orientation and a map of an area because they're not gathering a whole lot of other information. So they kind of have to say, okay, I gotta go three blocks here, two blocks there, et cetera. And they, they really, it's a, it's a very cerebral exercise um, in terms of information. Um, so you really need to be able to, to use your time distance to give the dog directions, as I said. If you're looking for a particular destination, you can't start telling the dog left, left, left at the beginning of the block and say, okay, he's going to find that, that middle store. Right, right. No, 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 no. <laughs> you got to say, I'm about where I want to go to. Right, so when you yeah, give him the left, absolutely. he can look around and say, oh, yeah, I kind of know where I am, and, yep. and go to your destination. Yep. Very, very important. Whereas with a cane, you would just kind of walk along and, and, and feel the different features until you find, oh, okay, here's the store with the, with the mat that slopes up. Okay, I know where I am. And it's a very different way of traveling. It's very interesting. I've been paired with a guide dog for about 30 years, just coming up on 30 years. Not the same dog, but... Um, and I, it's interesting how when I started, there was this very definite feeling from the schools. You, know, you throw away your cane, it's, it's useless. We don't want to hear anything about your cane. And to now, where there's actually a, a, a lecture in class about how to utilize your cane when you're using your dog. So for example, if I'm going to a building and I know that I have to go to the fifth room on the right, particularly like in college or a doctor's office, so I, my dog might get me to the building, into the building, into the elevator, and onto that floor. But I might then take out my cane, because I can't, it, it's very frustrating for the dog to be going, find right, 
okay, one door, fine, right? Okay, two doors. The dog's like, this is the stupidest thing we ever, and they start to question what, if you even know what you're doing. Put the dog into a heel, hold the leash, use my cane and count the doors that way. So now, I, well, I always carry a cane with me as a backup anyway, but there are times where even as I'm actively using my guide dog, I will put down the harness handle and take out the cane because I need to do feature by feature searching. And, and I just think it's so cool the guide dog schools are finally accepting that that is what we were doing in the field anyway. Yeah, so exactly. They for teaching rural us travel, how to do it. <laughs> and even for rural travel, a cane is handy because yeah. the dogs are taught to stay away from the, from the guidelines. So if you're yeah. walking facing traffic, they're, ter they're constantly taking you away from that edge right. and kind of into traffic. So you need to check with that cane, kind of make sure yep. that you're kind of near where you want to be. Yeah. Um, Another thing that the, the guide dog user relies on, more of their senses in terms of surfaces, um, slopes, for instance, um, telling where maybe they're crossing over a driveway or the, the wheelchair ramp or something like that. Um, surface changes underfoot, you know, maybe from just regular sidewalk to cobblestone. Uh, they're paying a lot of attention to that. Um, as I mentioned previously, um, open versus closed spaces. You know, is there a, an alleyway that I pass and then my destination is just past that? Or is there a section of stores that's more indented, like in West Hartford Center, mm -hmm. and then it closes in and they're very close to me on the sidewalk? Um, these are things that the guide dog user has to get used to picking up fairly quickly. A cane user, they have some time as they're traveling slower to pick this up. <laughs> guide dog user has to be able to pick that. Oh, yeah, here's the change. You know, and I got to be looking for my destination now. Um, also, um, you're familiar with, with facial vision. Okay? Yes. Just in terms of, yep. of, you know, you can tell, gee, there's a tree here, there's a pole here, a particularly large obstacle. Um, Explain sometimes that a little bit more for our viewers because it's a very, I have a hard time explaining it and I, I can use it a little facial, bit. So. Facial vision is that sense that something is there, okay? And it's based on sound. They've actually done experiments where they've plugged up people's ears and they, they would walk into things. They couldn't tell anything was there. But what basically there's always ambient sound in the environment and it's always reflecting off of things and someone who is very good and has, has developed this and people develop it to different extents uh, but you can kind of say oh you know something is there it's subconscious you just feel that something is there but your body taking those sound waves and interpreting them as something is there a feeling that I'm close to something uh, and to see I've had people that were so talented they could walk down a street and go you know pole tree Car, they put the van. rest of us to shame. I'll they, tell you yeah, that. There are Everyone people, thinks we should be able to do that. <laughs> yes, but it, it's, it's a real skill, and relatively few people have it to that extent. But most people have it to a certain extent. And you can actually train people a bit with it uh, if you have a, a structured environment where you can do this. Um, but facial vision um, is very, very important for somebody with a guide dog because, again, they're traveling through the environment quickly. If they can pick up stuff like that, they can travel very, very well. Um, there's a real good example. There's a bus shelter uh, on West Hart in West Hartford on Main Street there on Farmington Avenue where you walk by it and you know immediately where you are because you can feel the reflected sound right, exactly. from it. Even somebody who's like me <laughs> doesn't have that good facial vision, I can pick that up. So uh, it's very interesting. Um, another thing that's kind of interesting is the social interaction. And, and I know we've, we've had discussions about this. Um, people seem to be more willing to start a conversation with somebody who has a guide dog as opposed to somebody who's carrying a cane. So you have to kind of be ready for that. And also, with, as a dog guide user, you have to be ready for the, the negative interactions. You know, uh -huh. somebody trying to pet your dog or, or here, have a hot dog or a french fry or something. Yep. And you have to be willing to step in and, and say, yeah, no, you really shouldn't be doing that. So that's a big difference, I think, in, in traveling between a cane and, and a guide dog. And you might want to speak a little bit about some of your experiences with that. I've definitely found that that's true, although it's interesting to me. I, I like the fact that as a guide dog traveler, people are more likely to talk to me, which means that if I need assistance, if I'm, if I'm disoriented or I, I'm really in a new area, I'm more likely to have someone talk to me, which means that I can ask them for assistance. Mm -hmm. However, my experience, again, most recently when I was between dogs, was that as a, as a cane traveler, people more readily offered assistance in places where I go all the time and have never offered assistance. And I think it's a couple of things. First of all, no one has ever walked up to me and said, that is a gorgeous cane. What breed is it? What's its name? How old is it? It never happened to me. People constantly ask about the dog. And I always say to someone who's trying to make the choice between a dog and a cane, you are not ever going to be anonymous. You will hear conversations change. People will stop. It's, it, it's just the way it is. Um, sometimes that's good, many times it's frustrating, sometimes it's downright dangerous, um, but the bottom line is that's what it is. However, I think there's a perspective on the part of the general public that the dog is actually doing everything so that 
Whereas they see a person with a cane and they maybe think that there's no way that that person might know where they are. They, they look at the dog, they might even think the person is confused or lost, but the assumption is, well, the dog will figure it out because there isn't the awareness that the dog is not the, the dog is, is the pilot, but the dog is only going to do what it's directed to do by its navigator. Mm -hmm. If the navigator's lost, the dog is going to be like, you need to give me instruction. You need to tell me right or left right. or forward or something. Right. I and, if you're not, and if you're not giving it to me, I'm not just going to make choices because that's not what I'm supposed yeah, to do. I always say the dog is just going to get you lost faster. Right. And, yeah. and if you learn your route wrong the first time with a dog, you will do it wrong consistently, beautifully, forever. I often learn a route for the first time with my cane because again the cane doesn't have a brain it doesn't have feelings so if i do this if i walk the same sidewalk 10 15 times to get that time distance to to figure out the cane doesn't care the dog on the other hand if you rework the same they're going to be like when you rework something with a dog it's usually because they did something wrong right they maybe missed a curb they made an error in judgment about you know, a width of something, so you bumped your arm. So you rework that to remind them this is what you're looking for. So if you do the same little piece of your route multiple times, your dog gets really stressed out because they're like, I didn't do it wrong. Why are we doing this? So if you can learn something with a cane first, take all the time you want, walk back and forth a gazillion times, who cares? Then you have it in your head. Then you go work it with the dog you're not having to so so a lot of times the cane is a really good way to, to learn especially inside like a building mm -hmm. or distances if you're really if you have to target something very specific i always learn it with a cane first yeah get yourself familiar with it right. first so the dog has confidence in you and exactly you they, shows what they, she's doing. they're yeah. really looking to us and if we are lost or confused they know that and they're like dude this is <laughs> you're supposed to be the one in yeah. charge here and i don't like this so much and often depending on the dog they'll start to offer you stuff okay you don't know what you want so here's a door mm -hmm. here's a bench Really, here's mm -hmm. just here. Try this. <laughs> try this. You want this? Um, yeah. So it really is important. So it's so it's interesting. It's true. I find that people are more willing to talk to me because they can say, "Oh, that's a pretty dog," or "What's its name?" or whatever. But when I have a cane, if I can get them to stop, which many people won't, they're more they're more readily accepting that I might need a, or assuming mm -hmm. that I might need assistance. It's a very interesting sort of juxtaposition that I haven't found a a, a solution for, but certainly. Having a guide dog, it doesn't matter where you are, out to dinner, on a date, um, in a big family crowd, by yourself, with, in the middle of a conversation, you will be constantly interrupted. And for some people, that is too big a drawback, and I, I can see where that, I, I, I'm never, I could never judge that, because it can get so old and mm -hmm. so tiresome. Yeah, and you have to be prepared as a guide dog user to handle those types of situations. Absolutely, cane, and they're, and they're dogs, which means a, they're not perfect. It's mm -hmm. not a machine. Will your dog sometime? Will, will it ever happen that in the course of your relationship with your dog that they will throw up in the store, or have an accident on the bus because they're sick? These things can happen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not fun. It doesn't happen often. But you're not using an inanimate object. You're using a real living. You're partnered with a real living creature, which means that they have real living issues and so sometimes and and people can get very confusing he'll miss a sale oh isn't he trained well of course he's trained but he ha he made him haven't you ever made a mistake in your whole life wow i want to be you mm -hmm. um so and people are very i find that people are very critical if if i've i'll have someone come up to me and say oh i've been watching you come to this store for five years and i remember that time three years ago when your dog bumped you into a carriage really <laughs> that's what you remember and mm -hmm. um so it's it's an interesting thing that mm -hmm. Um, but it's, uh, it, it, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> it's yep. good One other that. thing I want to get to, um, that, that the difference between a cane and a guide dog is that the cane, the guide dog can bring you through situations that a cane traveler would find difficult, particularly with adverse weather, such as a, a very heavy snowfall or something like that. The yes. dog, because he's familiar with the route, can get you through. A cane user would have a lot of difficulty because the snow would cover all the landmarks. Right, exactly. I, my dog in college got me through a blizzard. That I, there was not a sidewalk to be mm -hmm. found, and I was so confused. I couldn't hear my auditory landmarks. I finally just said, find home, find it. Mm -hmm. I, I'm in, and when I finally stopped trying to figure it out and let her do it, mm -hmm. we got home like that. <laughs> yep. I was like, oh, good, I should have yep. done that 10 minutes ago. Yep, yep. one last point is the, there's the, the cane and the guide dog. You know, guide dog, you know, you got to take care of it. You got to take it to the vet. You got to feed it. You got to pick up after it. Cane, you get home, stick it in the corner, you're yes. done. You are and that's, absolutely right. That's, and that's an that's individual huge. choice. I have people yeah. that want the cane because of that. They, they don't want to deal with that. I have people that love the guide dog and are willing to put up with almost anything to have that guide dog. Absolutely. I've always said that a guide dog is not just a mobility choice, it's a lifestyle choice. Exactly. Because yes. there's way more than 
than just, like you said, every now and then you got to replace the tip on a cane. <laughs> Aside yes. from that, it can That's sit it. in the shelf for six months yeah. and work just as well when you mm -hmm. pick it up. Um, I'm so glad that you came in. I'm so excited about this, this series that I'm doing. And I think, I think it's really important for people to understand that it's a process that someone has to go through, that you don't just wake up one morning, as you said, and go, I want a guide dog today. And off you go and you get your guide dog and it's all great. So many of us, before we get our first guide dog, think that. And I also really wanted you to come because it's so important for people to know about the importance of orientation and mobility, whether or not you're expecting, anticipating getting a guide dog or not. Again, you're watching, as I see it, A Blind Woman's View. This is the second installment of the series that I'm working on called Pup and Person to Partners. I'm so grateful that you tuned in and have a great month and be nice to each other. Thanks so much.